So let's cover some specific types of subspaces. We defined subspaces, your homework was all good. Everyone seemed to get the concept. So let's say we have a matrix A. An M by N matrix A. We're going to define the null space of A, and it's going to be all the N by one vectors such that A times X equals the zero vector. And this is a subspace of R N. Um, proving that this is a subspace is pretty straightforward. What do we want? We want that the zero vector is there which it certainly is. Any matrix times the zero vector is still zero. And you want it to be closed under addition. So let's say V and W are in this null space. That is to say that A times V equals zero and A times W equals zero. We want their sum to be in the null space. And matrix multiplication distributes over that vector addition and zero plus zero is indeed zero. So this is closed under vector addition. And if we take one of these vectors and we now ask, is this closed under scalar multiplication? Um, we can move scalars around. We've kept saying that. We haven't really used it for anything. Now we'll use it. That scalar can pull out. A times V is the zero vector. A scalar times the zero vector is the zero vector. So this is a subspace of Rn. It's closed under everything, and the zero vector is in there. And um, this is a very important subspace in a lot of applications, and we'll get to some of that down the line. But this is fundamental, like this, well, last Thursday when I said, like, oh, every, uh, every 
the zero vector is always a subspace, but it's not a very interesting subspace. This is an interesting subspace. We can find the no space of A because we know how to solve matrix equations. We, we know how to solve AX equals zero, and all of those solutions are the null space. So if, for example, A equals, let's keep this small, one, two, four, zero, one, one. And we wanted to find the null space of A. First of all, where is the null space? It's part of R3 because A is two by three and the null space is a subspace of R3. And to find it, we just take the matrix We augment it with the zero vector, and then we'd perform row reduction. We put this in reduced row echelon form. And ordinarily, I'd be reaching for my calculator, but went out of my way to make this easy. We'll multiply the second row by negative two, add it to the first row. And that does it. The matrix is in reduced row echelon four. We've got, and this is going back to the question you were just asking. We've got three variables. X1 plus 2X3 equals zero, but we can take the 2X3 over to the right. Let's do so. X1 equals negative two X3. Let's see, second row, X2 plus X3 equals zero. But once again, we're going to take that X three over to the right. And we don't have an equation for X three, but certainly anything has to equal itself. And the solution to all of this is then the vector x equals the free variable x3 times the vector negative 2, negative 1, 1. So as long as we remember how to solve these things, 
And I mean, assuming that the null space isn't just the zero vector, that will mean that this equation has infinitely many solutions. So we need to remember how to do all of this, but it's just old material stated a little differently. Instead of telling you to solve the homogeneous equation, AX equals zero, I'm saying find the null space of A, but those are the exact same thing. So the next definition is the column space. And once again, we have a matrix. The column space is the span of the columns of the matrix. And the column space is a subspace of Rm. And it's a subspace of Rm because the span of vectors is always a vector space. That was a theorem we gave um, on Thursday of last week. And for now, asking you to find the column space is kind of inane. I mean, you can just read the column space out. Like if A is the matrix 1, 2, 4, 5, 0, negative 1, then the column space of A is all the vectors that can be written as a linear combination of these columns. We're going to come back to this though. Um, in fact, we're going to come back to this maybe next class. Well, next class period is the test, but you know what I mean. Maybe the next lecture. This isn't a good description of the column space. Um, it's a very wordy description of the column space. And what I mean by that is that this sort of description of the column space has three vectors in it. And it's possible to describe the column space with fewer vectors. It's possible to find a shorter description that only has two vectors in it. And this is coming back to the concept of linear dependence. Um, these three vectors form a linearly dependent set. We would like, for reasons that are going to become apparent, to um, have a linearly independent set. But for now, we can describe column spaces. There is nothing much else to say about this for now. 
do notice that although we are presenting column and um, no spaces together, they live in different vector spaces. That is to say that if A is M by N, the column space of A lives in Rm, and the no space of A lives in Rn. So basically every textbook I've looked at presents them together, but they're pretty different. And I mean, they're also different in the sense that we have an explicit description of the column space, but only an implicit description of the row space. That is to say, when we were asked for the column space, there wasn't any work to be done. We have an explicit description immediately. When we were asked for the null space, we had to perform gauss stored in elimination and do some stuff like that. We define the column space and the null space in terms of matrices A and their subspaces of Rn and Rm. We can define the equivalent of these things for arbitrary vector spaces, or at least for arbitrary linear transformation. I should say. So say we have two vector spaces, V and W, and these are no longer assumed to be the nice vector spaces we are used to. They could be whatever. They could be spaces of continuous functions. They could be infinite sequences with some kind of addition defined on them. They're arbitrary. But say that we have a mapping from V to W. And say that this mapping is linear. So remember that linearity is defined in terms of addition and scalar multiplication. And V has addition in it and it has scalar multiplication in it. And so does W. So the way we define linearity, that if we have addition in the first vector space, that's the same as having addition in the second vector space. We defined linearity for Rn, but it, it's a perfectly nice definition for arbitrary vector spaces. Likewise, for any vector space, a scalar times a vector is defined. So the second linearity condition makes sense. So we can talk about linear transformations from one vector space to another vector space, not just um, Rn. We're going to define 
two vector spaces. And one of these definitions is an old one that you saw in algebra and have been seeing periodically since then, the range of the transformation. And this is the definition you should be expecting. It's all of the vectors in W such that all of the vectors, let's put that in there, W in W such that for some V in V, T of V, equals W. So this is precisely the math 142 college algebra definition of the range. It's just instead of the real numbers, we have vector spaces. And the range is closely related to one of the definitions we just had on the board. The range is very closely related to the definition of the column space. In particular, if we have a matrix A, an M by N matrix. And we use that matrix to define a linear combination, sorry, a linear transformation. Then the range of this linear transformation is the column space of A. So the range generalizes the definition of the columns. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, the range basically is the column space when in, remember that every, sorry, let's try that again. Remember that every linear transformation from Rn to Rm can be written like this. You apply the transformation to the E sub one, E sub two, up to E sub n. You make that a matrix, and the linear transformation can be written T of x equals AX. So every linear transformation from Rn to Rm has a range because every linear transformation period has a range. And it makes sense to ask about the column space of A, and they're the same thing. The column space of the matrix is the range. This is going later to give us a way to find some ranges of some linear transformations that are not from Rn to Rm. So we're going to be coming back to this fact. For now, I just state it and move on to the next definition, the kernel of a linear 
transformation. So this is probably a new one, but it's all of the vectors V such that T of V equals the zero vector. So just like the range is basically the same as a column space, the kernel is basically the same as a null space. If you have a linear transformation of this special form, then the kernel of T is the null space of A. So let's give an example of these definitions in a situation that has nothing to do with matrices. Let's, let's think back to calculus. And as part of this, we are going to have to define a few special vector spaces. You don't need to memorize this terminology, but the vector space written as a capital C with a one in the superscript is all the differentiable functions whose derivative is continuous. And when I say differentiable and continuous, I mean differentiable and continuous everywhere on the entire real number line. This, if you wanted the kind of fancy sounding phrase, these are the continuous differentiable functions. And then we'll define C zero. And these are just going to be the continuous functions with no reference to the derivative. And let's define a linear transformation from C1 to C0. My all of this talk about derivatives may have kind of given away what we want to do. Let's call this transformation D. And D is going to take a function as its input, and it's going to give the derivative as its output. So D is a transformation 
from C1 to C0. And it's a linear transformation. And the fact that it's linear is just a fancy way of saying some calculus facts that you learned way back in calculus one. If we apply D to a sum, then we're differentiating the sum. And the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. And that's D of F plus D of G. And if we apply D to a scalar times F, that's the derivative of the scalar times F. And when we're differentiating, we basically ignore scalars. We just take the derivative of the function and the scalar just sits there. And that's then the scalar times D of F. So this is a linear transformation. And any linear transformation has a range and it has a kernel. Maybe the range and the kernel aren't very interesting. Maybe one of them, for example, is just the zero vector. But at least the range and the kernel exist. The range of D, this is again a calculus facts. We don't know any linear algebra way of approaching this problem, but the range is all of C zero. And that's because let F belong to C zero. It is a calculus fact that every continuous function has an indefinite integral, an antiderivative, in other words, and the derivative of the antiderivative is the original function. So every function in C0 is mapped to by its antiderivative. In fact, antiderivatives aren't unique, right? Remember the plus C is the constants. So every function in C0 is mapped to by infinitely many functions in C1. For the kernel, let's see if we can work the kernel out. The function or the transformation, I should say, takes a function and differentiates it. The kernel is all of the things that are sent to zero by that. So 
What's the kernel of the derivative? What are functions whose derivative is zero? Scalar. Yeah, scalar or constants might be a more standard way of yeah. saying that, but all of the constant functions are the kernel. And the kernel, I guess I did prove that the kernel is a subspace. We can see that. The zero function is a constant function. The sum of two constants is a constant. A scalar times a constant is a constant. So this really is a subspace of C zero. Any questions so far? Uh, 